Hi, I'm Christy Shriver, and we're here to discuss books that have changed the world and have changed us. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit podcast. This week, we began our first episode in our series on Aldous Huxley's Negative Utopia, uh, as he described his novel, uh, Brave New World. And if you're reading the book for the first time, this episode will get you some pre-reading information and hopefully take you through chapters one and two, which are the chapters about the hatchery. So let's get started. Let's do it. Uh, First, it's important to note that this book was published in the UK in 1931, So for context, let's think about what was happening or really what hadn't happened yet in Europe or the rest of the world. I mean, the book is pre-Hitler, it's pre-Stalin, it's pre-internet, it's pre-mass media, it's pre-social engineering. I mean, he predates a lot of things that define what we call the modern world. Yet you might not think that just reading it. I mean, it predates Orwell's 1984 also. Um, that book wasn't written until um, 1948. You know, yes, he switched the numbers there. So <laughs> You know, I didn't really know that for a long time. Yeah. Uh, so much of the science in this book had to seem so strange and futuristic at the time he wrote it. You know, for example, uh, DNA wouldn't even be discovered until 1958. And in vitro fertilization wouldn't really be invented until 1971. And Yet Huxley's book opens with test tube babies, uh, a term all of us have heard of today. I'm also sure uh, a world where all people are on psychiatric drugs also seemed far-fetched in (laughs) 1931. And today, one in six Americans uh, self-report regularly taking a psychiatric drug. And that number is likely uh, just a fraction of the reality. If you consider all the different variations of both legal and illegal and semi-legal forms that are available (laughs) today. You know, Huxley's Brave New World is about achieving happiness. It's about total sexual liberation. It's about the exaltation of science over faith and religion. It's about an entirely efficient and centralized government worldwide that fabricates peace on earth and goodwill towards men, you know, to quote the biblical phrase. And the stated purpose of the coming of Jesus Christ, which is announced by the angels at Christmas. And yet even the title, Brave New World, reeks of irony. Every single person in this brave new world is undeniably happy. That is never questioned. Yet we're left with a feeling that maybe even happiness really isn't always good. Huxley's Brave New World is a comfortable world. There's no violence. There's no rule by fear. Nothing like what you see in Orwell's novels. There's no illness or aging. Uh, In fact, it is a world genetically engineered to preclude unhappiness or anxiety of any kind. And the goal of achieving unending and unlimited pleasure for all has been achieved. And yet, as we read it, it still feels wrong. I mean, we get a sense that we wouldn't like living in this reality, you know, but why? I mean, uh, we feel something's been lost and, and Huxley asks us to ask ourselves what's been lost. Right. And it's satire. I mean, he's mocking us and the irony wears on us as we go through the story. Remember the word irony. Now that word means the opposite. In other words, We feel that things should be the opposite as how he describes them as being. Well, Christy, uh, we talked about satire with Jonathan Swift, uh, with Orwell and with Bradbury, but let's define what that is. I mean, if you say something is satirical, I kind of immediately expect it to be funny, but there's nothing funny in this book. No, uh, Brave New World is not funny. In fact, Huxley is not a funny person at all. I mean, I've listened to a number of his lectures on YouTube, and I would describe his delivery and even his sense of writing as boring and almost obnoxious. I mean, satire is often funny because humor, if the writer uses it well or the artist uses it well, it seduces us into listening to points of view that otherwise we would reject. Humor, you know, it disarms an audience and they would be turned off if you were bored or annoyed if you were saying these same things through a lecture or in a sermon. So satire uses humor, but it isn't satire. You know, it's a strat. Humor is the strategy. Satires also use irony, exaggeration, sometimes just plain ridicule. 
What differentiates satire from just a joke or maybe a parody is that it's for a serious or moral purpose. So satire is not a joke for a joke's sake, but if you use a joke to make a serious point, now you're creating satire. So in this case, Huxley is not just making test tube babies for funsies. Mm. <laughs> I mean, he is all sci- satirists do. He has this moral purpose, this position to argue, and he's going to use these mental images of this super society as a way to make his case instead of just fussing at us about the way we're living our lives. The reason Huxley is so often compared to Orwell is that they were very alarmed, both of them, at how easy it is for evil-possessed people to subdue innocent, good entire populations through deception, through our own trust, complacency. I mean, both men were alarmed, and they were alarmed by the possibilities of industrialization, of technology, other tools of progress, but tools that can be turned against into destroying us. And both stories communicate warnings. Both books are satirical. Both project into the future. And both are products of observations that were made at the turn of the 20th century, which is why they're both compared all the time. Uh, yeah, you know, we brought up George Orwell's name twice now. And if you just uh, Google Huxley, you'll see endless comparisons of these two men to the point that you might be led to believe they're saying the same thing. Um, in fact, you might be tempted to think that if you understand Orwell, maybe you don't need to read Huxley because it's just the same warning just said in different words. Uh, but in fact, um, Huxley and Orwell have very different visions and different concerns about the world. They both saw mankind and freedom uh, as being under threat, but they saw these threats very, very differently. Brave New World is not Animal Farm. It's not 1984 at all. No, you're right. It's not. Uh, they both project, project destruction sort of, if you want to look at that way, but they see them almost as opposites. I mean, you could say, you know, Orwell sees the world ending by fire. Huxley sees it ending by ice, you know, a little frosty and illusion there. (laughs) But in both cases, humanity's dead. Uh, Maybe it's because we just finished our series on King Solomon and the book of Ecclesiastes. So, you know, Solomon's ideas are coloring my reading of the book right now. But Huxley, to me, sees us as being accomplices to our own self-destruction very much the same way King Solomon does. And if you haven't listened to the Solomon series, Solomon's book is, you know, his search for meaning, not meaning in the afterlife, but meaning, but a meaningful existence on earth. Solomon had everything life could give him. And the question he asks and answers is basically, now what? If I have everything, what does this mean? Well, Huxley essentially makes everyone Solomon. Even the lowly atomatomic epsilons, everyone has everything they want. Huxley argues the same exact thing that Solomon does, except he asks us to, to ask ourselves not what the meaning of life is, but if we want a life that is meaningful. And he, he suggests that really maybe many of us Maybe most of us, we don't. Uh, We prefer, we would be willing to trade an awful lot of our lives, of ourselves, to have a life that is totally meaningless. Uh, And he's going to ask, are we willing to surrender our humanity for a meaningless life? He asks the question in such a way that he expects a lot of us to say, sure, I'll take that deal. I'll take a brave new world. So it sounds strange if I put it in those terms. uh, But if we look at the way that many of us live our lives, the way we pursue entertainment, escapism, you know, it makes him feel a lot more informed (laughs) about who we really are. Life in Huxley's Brave New World embraces meaninglessness as an objectified way of life. It celebrates it. What would the world be like if everyone could literally have everything they wanted all the time? Everything in Brave New World is constructed by scientific and careful design to simulate biological impulses without actually any of the accompanying emotions that accompany these biological impulses. So essentially, if you have no attachment, you can have no real emotions, So you can't have positive emotions, but you're not going to have 
negative emotions. So what if we could have the endorphin hit that we would get from positive emotions without the risk? Uh, we are going to, and that's what he does, chemically create these biological responses without the problems that come with actual emo- emotions. Let's put all of this in a pill. Science has won in the brave new world and has evolved enough to be able to create in a test tube a life form that is completely self-satisfied and engineered for happiness as the ultimate end. Essentially, we have maybe two of Thomas Jefferson's (laughs) three ideals, life and happiness. In Brave New World, the purpose in life is to perpetuate the meaninglessness of life, which results in happiness, and that is a good thing. Uh, that is quite a statement, and I have to applaud you on working Thomas Jefferson. Uh, I know I did that for you. Oh, thanks. You know, I I noticed besides dropping liberty, you also modified Jefferson's quote: "Brave New World doesn't have the pursuit of happiness; it's just happiness." And you make it sound like it's a bad thing. Uh, in fact, it almost sounds that just happiness with no freedom means no life. I mean, uh, are we going to philosophical circles here? <laughs> I know it's a paradox and it's why you're better off reading his ideas in a story than in some of his mind numbing (laughs) essays. So, you know, let's walk it back. Do we want to be happy? And of course we're supposed to say yes, who doesn't? But it's within the framework of that question that he will ask us to evaluate our understanding of all these other things. What do we feel about sexual intimacy, the role of drugs, the need for our family, the purpose of science, the meaning of religion, the inevitability of hierarchies, our need for order, the purpose of cleanliness. Essentially, we're talking about the role of progress. Uh, what if you could be biologically engineered for happiness? Uh, you know, And then he's going to ask again, uh, what now after that? I mean, is this uh, brave new world worth having? And in some ways, it's a response to the Adam and Eve story of the Bible. Uh, essentially, in Brave New World, man has biologically engineered Adam and Eve to never have the option to eat forbidden fruit. And <laughs> they are engineered to not need each other at all. I mean, man can and does live alone. And science, or Ford, I would, as in Henry Ford here, uh, who is the deity standing for science in this book, Uh, He's programmed human beings to never even want anything except those things that would make us happy, which is essentially reduced to biological responses. I mean, would life in a technological garden with endless food and no problems, no illness, no pain, no relationship problems, with the only work that I'm conditioned to want to do uh, under those circumstances, would life be perfect? Well, you know, you just ask people that and ask them to respond in a poll. I'm not sure you'd get agreement (laughs) on the answer to that question. No, I mean, that's it exactly. I mean, if we permit humans to be uniquely human, we can't agree. Uh, But what if we could be biologically wired and psychologically conditioned to do so, just like in Brave New World? (laughs) Well, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, And so... Before we enter the hatchery of this brave new world and see how he could possibly make this scenario of garden-like perfection a fictional fictional possibility, let's talk about this interesting man, Aldous Huxley. He is interesting. Um, you know, many people would be surprised to know that during his lifetime, Aldous Huxley was one of the most famous people in the entire world. I mean, there were myths about how brilliant he was, that he'd memorized the entire Encyclopedia Britannica. I don't know how many volumes that is. (laughs) Uh, uh, And had made the smartest people in the world look stupid, or at least narrow in their knowledge about the world. Um, However, after he died, his fame dissipated very quickly to the point um, that now most people know him for one, maybe two things. They may remember his name for having to read the book we're talking about, Brave New World, uh, a book most people read when they were too young to understand it. <laughs> so true. Or secondly, they know him as the hippie who did all the experiments on himself with LSD, <laughs> trying to have spiritual experiences um, through biological means. Uh, he was truly a great thinker, and his ideas are ironically still as relevant today as they were at the time. Which is ironic when you think about the fact that most books about technology, um, by the nature of the genre, are usually dated at least within the century. I mean, 
Um, so let's get a few details. Who is the guy behind the world where everyone gets everything they ever wanted? <laughs> well, you know, in some ways, he isn't that fascinating if you want to compare him to Ishmael Bea. I mean, he's not a child soldier. He didn't have AIDS like Mary Fisher. He didn't have a childhood nemesis like Harper Lee. Huxley, everyone would agree today, uh, was raised as a man of privilege. I mean, he wasn't wealthy necessarily, but he had a couple of genetic advantages that he was able to leverage. For example, he was born on July 26, 1894 to a man named Leonard Huxley, which is not anyone anyone's ever heard of, but they probably have heard of, if you've studied a lot of science, have heard of his grandfather on his paternal side, T.H. Huxley. T.H. Huxley, Huxley has been named Charles Darwin's bulldog. Essentially, he was the man responsible for pushing today what we call evolution or Darwinism in the academic community. He promoted it. He defended Darwin's ideas of evolution so much that many think that the theory of evolution would never have gotten out. It wouldn't be in any textbooks if it weren't for the influence and the promotion of T.H. Huxley. T.H. Huxley famously coined the expression agnostic, a word most of us have heard of. That's how he described his religious beliefs at a meeting at the Metaphysical Society in London. His contributions in science education, I mean, they're felt around the world to this day. So he's got that going on, uh, this heavyweight grandfather. But his brother uh, is Sir Julian Huxley, and he was a very important evolutionary biologist. I mean, he's got a long list of job ac accomplishments I wouldn't bore you with, but you may have heard of UNESCO. He was the first director of that. He's a founding member of the World Wildlife Fund. Uh, his stepbrother, Andrew, won the Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine. So I hope you're you know, getting the vibe here. <laughs> that doesn't even end. His mother's side is also academically important. His grandfather, I mean, his grandfather's, un well, his mother's uncle, let me put it that way, was the famous educator and writer, Matthew Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew Arnold, uh, as in uh, the poem Dover Beach, Matthew Arnold? Yes, that's the one. Wow, well, he was the first poet we ever featured here on the podcast. I know. So, even though, I mean, Huxley wasn't landed gentry per se, I mean, these are very important people. This is a very important family. He went to all the right and elite British schools. Uh, those, the ones that were, you know, so famous for producing incredible uh, genius British writers and thinkers. He went to Eton, then he went to college in Oxford. I mean, his initial desire was to pursue, you know, this family legacy and biology. But unfortunately, all this academic pedigree could not buy him uh, perfection. He loved biology. He loved science, but he was never going to be able to be a doctor. He was never going to be able to work in a lab because of his eyesight. When he was in high school at age 16, he contracted a disease and it caused inflammation of the cornea left him blind in one eye and half blind in the other. Ironically, something that would have been solved with, you know, penicillin. Had, and with science. Yeah, with science. I mean, he had to drop out of school for a while. He was able to go back. Uh, he attended Balliol College in Oxford, where he would read for eight hours a day, even if he had to use a magnifying glass, because he really believed he had this limited amount of time to absorb information before he would be completely blind. But he, he never was. He graduated and ironically went back to Eaton to teach for a short period. He married a woman by the name of Maria Nice um, really fairly quickly. And then he uh, began writing and it wasn't too long before he became you know, famous. He wrote a little poetry, plays, essays. But in 1921, his first novel came out, Chrome Yellow, and he made his reputation. What's interesting about that book, uh, besides the fact that a lot of the sciencey ideas from that book we see again in Brave New World, is that you know people really liked it. <laughs> well, uh, I know what you mean by being surprised that people liked it. Um, although most people would think that's implied when you say he made his reputation <laughs> off this book. But Huxley's style is a little hard to like if you don't know what to expect. It's easy to see why a lot of students can't appreciate the book as teenagers. 
If you read Brave New World um, expecting plot or interesting characters that you can fall in love with, you are going to be disappointed. Right. And if you think that, you might hate the book. Uh, You know, it's not about the plot. It's an argument disguised as a story. It's about the irony. Um, Isn't that how we feel about all the classics? I mean, the books are really just vehicles for authors to talk about their ideas. Yes. Uh, But... Especially in this book. I mean, the plot really is quite minimal. The characters are all arguably unlikable. Most of them are also uninteresting. They're sterile. They're identical. Uh, You can't possibly be sad if any of them die. They're easily (laughs) replaced. And that, of course, is Huxley's point. Uh, There's been criticism of Huxley's work that that's the reason why we don't that they're not any good. We can't attach emotionally to books and we're supposed to emotionally attach to books. But but ironically, by design, if you think that way, you're missing the point of the book. So what is the point that he's trying to make? In 1958, Huxley published a series of essays titled Brave New World Revisited. And in that essay, he interprets for himself his own novel (laughs) 25 years after he wrote it. He felt a lot had happened during those 25 years, and obviously it had, and a lot of that had proven he was right. I mean, there had been two world wars. There had been world dictators. There had been technology, the atomic bomb. He points out how some of the things that he predicted had already come true, except a lot sooner than he predicted. But there were things that he had anticipated, of course, that hadn't come out yet or hadn't happened yet. He sticks with his main warnings, but he modifies his timeline to some degree and explains things, you know, from the perspective of how the world had changed between the years 1931 and 1958. The essay is fascinating if you want to read the whole thing. It's 92 pages long, so I don't know. It's up to you, but it's there for you if you choose to, to partake. Hey, when you get above 90 pages, it's a book. Uh, that's I a good point. You can call it an essay. Um, I do want to point out, because you know this was a conception a lot of us have, uh, that this is one of those books that's going to take a position um, that too much science or progress is a bad thing because uh, you know that's not his point. In fact, Huxley is on the record as saying, as most scientists will, that science is itself, and this is very important, morally neutral. Uh, Neither is Huxley trying to imagine where science will be in the future in regard to what machines will be doing. He's talking about the present, his present day, for sure, but also our present day, especially in regard to psychology and political propaganda, and of course, uh, where those two merge in our daily lives, what we would call advertising. (laughs) He's interested in what we will be doing. Science is neutral, but unchecked power in the hands of scientists, no matter how noble they claim to be, is just as corrupting and intoxicating as power in the hands of politicians or in the hands of business people or in the hands of any of us. Right, and he sets his book comfortably in the distant future, in AF 632, after Ford, because that seems far away enough to not feel threatening. I mean, we don't feel like we're being preached at. The same reason Swift set his stories in faraway lands. Satire feels less personal when you put it in these crazy settings. But in Huxley's case... He opens his book with a tour of a hatchery because for Huxley, it always boils down to biology first. Biology is, of course, the essence and the beginning of life itself. So let's read that first page. A squat gray building of only 34 stories. Over the main entrance, the words Central London Hatchery and Conditioning Center. And in a shield, the world state's motto. Community, Identity, Stability. The enormous room on the ground floor faced towards the north. Cold for all the summer beyond the panes, for all the tropical heat of the room itself, a harsh, thin light glared through the windows, hungrily seeking some draped lay figure, some pallid shape of academic goose flesh, but finding only the glass and nickel and bleakly shining porcelain of a laboratory. Wintriness responded to wintriness. The overalls of the workers were white, their hands gloved with a pale corpse-colored rubber, 
The light was frozen, dead, a ghost. Only from the yellow barrels of the microscopes did it borrow a certain rich and living substance, lying along the polished tubes like butter, streak after luscious streak, in long recession down the work tables. And this, said the director, opening the door, is the fertilizing room. <laughs> so, uh, Christy, does Huxley give the story away in the first sentence, like we've said many times that they do? Well, you know, this is a gray world. We know it's a world of conditioning. We know the motto is community, identity, and stability. That's sentence one. In sentence two, we see words like cold, wintriness. In sentence three, we see words like corpse, frozen, dead, ghost. Then you see the science jargon, test tubes, microscopes, work tables, you know, what's your impression if I you put all those words together? <laughs> uh, it's sterile, you know, and it's clean, but it's also dead. Uh, wow, this book seems to be beginning with lifelessness. Exactly. And ironically, we're in the fertilizing mm, room. I see what he did there. <laughs> Knowing Huxley's background in biology, physiology, psychology, you, you can see that he wants to merge all three into the first two chapters of this book. The first two chapters have no action, very little characterization. That's why people think it's boring. But Huxley sets up one of his main concerns about the world. To what degree is man genetically modifiable and psychologically conditionable? And is that what we want? The answer seems to be that's what the state wants. <laughs> really, the 1% at the top, that's what they want. But is that what... We want, and even for those at the top, uh, do it, if it comes down to it, is that the best thing for anyone? And, and if it isn't, do we have a choice in the matter? In this world, the answer seems to be it's what we do want. If we're made to be happy, we don't really care. We don't care what it costs. Maybe we don't even care if we're alive. Uh, you know, I was reading about um, Huxley's first book, Chrome Yellow, the one that came out in 1921 uh, and made his reputation. And in it, he describes a world that isn't too different from the one in this hatchery. And, you know, let me quote the world in that book. An impersonal generation will take the place of nature's hideous system in vast state incubators. Rows upon rows of gravid bottles will supply the world with the population it requires. The family system will disappear Society, sapped at its very base, will have to find new foundations. And Eros, beautifully and irresponsibly free, will flit like a gay butterfly from flower to flower through a sunlit room. You know, I want to point out here, like in uh, other dystopian novels, the destruction of family and the manipulation of sex right here at the beginning. It's the heart of every one of these new and improved societies. Can I point out another piece of irony? Yes. A novel about happiness that is dystopian. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why he calls it negative utopia. Ah, right. Well, from a historical perspective, um, in the 1920s and 30s in particular, uh, a lot of thinkers like Bertrand Russell, uh, he immediately comes to mind, were really interested in how science and industrialization could be exploited. And I'm not talking about the atomic bomb. They didn't even know about that. I mean, we're talking mass production, mass distribution, uh, genetics, eugenics, psychology. Um, a lot of the things that we saw Hitler exploit during World War II. And uh, remember, Darwin's theories are, are just coming in vogue. And the big debate is what constitutes a human. Uh, that's the debate that emerges. Are, are we matter or are we an idea? Uh, th these are theological ideas as well, obviously, uh, you know, but that's a different conversation and not the one that these men are having. Um, Huxley and Russell, who were vitalists, in, in other words, believed we were more than matter and that life had purpose. They were also atheists. This ethical or moral debate was a debate about scientific fields in biology and physiology and psychology. These scientists believed, of course, uh, now, now we know they were wrong, but they believed we were on the verge of understanding the origins of life and as a result would be able to create it. Didn't we do this in Frankenstein? <laughs> 
uh, but and, they were coming closer. Uh, and, and it was it was they were, they were thinking along those lines, the, the those kind of morality discussions, which are still very important and still very unresolved. That's what what took place then. Right. You know, in 1926, Huxley, Huxley took this trip to the Far East. He went to India, Burma, Malaya. Uh, and during that trip, he took all these notes. Well, he published them in 1956. I bring this up because on his way back, he stops in the U.S., specifically Los Angeles. I want to read for you his description of L.A. and tell me what you think. Sorry, L.A. people. <laughs> well, they took a beating in Fahrenheit 451 <laughs> That's also. true, too. Los Angeles is the city of dreadful joy, or more briefly, the joy city. It is a city which everyone is, quote, happy, but no one quite sure why. It's a city burgeoning with activity, automobiles, advertising, entertainment of every sort, from religious to alcoholic, but a city completely without any kind of intellectual life or purpose. In the joy city, as in the brave new world, man is made for the good time. Not the good time for man, but continuous good times are conducive only to standardization and superficiality. The women, for example, are plumly ravishing and guy promises of Eliotesque pneumatic bliss, but for not much else to judge by their faces. So curiously uniform, unindividual and blank. (laughs) You know, you notice, you know, he's talking about these blank, unindiv- unindividual faces. That's before Botox and facelifts. I wonder what he think now, Justine. Uh, uh, I'm not going to hate on L.A., but, you know, it's kind of a funny description. Uh, well, you know, L.A. is his example because that's where he went. Uh, but the United States as a country is obviously the model for Huxley's Brave New World. It's why the industrialist Henry Ford is literally turned into a god in this book. True. In 1927, Huxley published an essay about American culture in general, and I'm going to read a quote. He says this, Speculating on the American future, we're speculating on the future of civilized man. One of the most ominous portents of the American way of life is that it embraces a large class of the people who do not want to be cultured or not interested in higher life. For these people, existence on the lower animal levels is perfectly satisfactory. Given food, drink, the company of their fellows, sexual enjoyment, and plenty of noisy distractions from without, they're happy. In America, all the resources of science are applied in order that imbecility may flourish and vulgarity covers the earth. Ouch, ouch. The resources of science are so applied because quantity rather than quality is profitable for the capitalist involved. The higher the degree of standardization in popular literature and art, the greater the profit for the manufacturer. All this mechanical and intellectual standardization, however, leads to the exaltation of the standardized man. Wow, what an insightful observation. And that is what this hatchery is about. It's creating a standardized man. That's it exactly. What we learn in the hatchery is that in the brave new world, there's going to be a lot of sex, but there is no reproduction through sex. Vivaporous, that's what they call it, reproduction, is what leads to children. And that is shameful, and it's a secret of the past. In this Ford assembly line inspired world, eggs are selected from disembodied ovaries, They're mixed in a culture with sperm. They're incubated in a clean, sterile environment. The embryos are designated into five castes, alpha and betas. Those are your elite classes. They come from one unique embryo per egg. But then you have the gammas, deltas, and epsilons. They're cloned into as many as 96 embryos per egg. And in this perfectly designed world, all men, we are told, are psychochemically equal, so they can be happy now. People are conditioned by genetic engineering, electric shocks, and represent and all these repetitions to accept their identities. <laughs> well, let's quote how um, Huxley described these lower castes in Brave New World Revisited. He said, they were subjected to the Bokanovsky process, 
96 identical twins out of a single egg and treated prenatally with alcohol and other protein poisons. The creatures finally decanted were almost subhuman, but they were capable of performing unskilled work and when properly conditioned, detentioned by free and frequent access to the opposite sex, constantly distracted by gratuitous entertainment and reinforced in their good behavior patterns by daily doses of soma, they could be counted on to give no trouble to their superiors. Right, and sex as a tool of manipulation wasn't just for Delta and Epsilon. Sexual experimentation in the Brave New World begins at six or eight for everyone. Life for everyone is physical gratification as well as the acquisition of infinite objects, consumerism. And of course, the glue that holds it all together is this thing called Soma. Quote, Half a gram for a half holiday, a gram for a weekend, two grams for a trip to the gorgeous east, three for a dark eternity to the moon. Soma, it's a mind-numbing drug, but it doesn't have any side effects. It cures everything from boredom to insecurity to any and all, as they say, miseries of space and time. But of course... All this hinges on the conditioning of humans that must be performed in what we call this hatchery. The director is going to put it this way. That's the secret of happiness and virtue, liking what you've got to do. All conditioning aims at that, making people like their inescapable social destiny. (laughs) Which is where you get to the real battleground of science during the 1920s and 30s. uh, And that would be the field of psychology. You know, Pavlov uh, had finished his recent experiment on conditioning and the reflexes of dogs, suggesting um, that so-called voluntary behavior was or at least could be conditioned behavior. Right. Pavlov's name comes up. You know, a few times in this book, we see it here in chapter two in the infant nurseries. They're called Neo Pavlovian or Pavlovian conditioning rooms. Tell us who was Pavlov and what was the experiment that he did? Well, first of all, the word Neo suggests new. So this is the new Pavlovian technique. And uh, quickly, uh, because I don't think you want to allow him to spend too much time going into classical conditioning and opera conditioning, but Pavlov was studying the digestive uh, tracts of dogs. The dogs were in harnesses. They would put food in front of the dogs. The dogs would eat it and digest it, and they would study that process. Well, they they noticed in the laboratory that the dogs began to salivate before they got the food. They would salivate at the side of a lab coat or the doorbell or any other number of things. And Pavlov understood that these animals were learning to anticipate things through other signals. And it's really interesting because the whole idea is we're going to transfer that to humans. And what they're going to do is learn to associate one thing with a new thing and therefore condition it to be the new behavior. Uh, we know how that these men really overestimated the power of conditioning. I mean, you've got uh, J.B. Watson, who was one of Pavlov's disciples, said this, Give me a dozen healthy infants, well-formed, and my own specified world to bring them up in, and I'll guarantee to take anyone at random and train him to become any type of specialist I might select. Doctor, lawyer, artist, merchant, chief, and yes, even beggar man, regardless of his talents, penchants, tendencies, abilities, vocations, or race of his ancestors. Um, you know, of course, there's been a lot of research to suggest that this is quite an overzealous uh, claim, and the fact that I have no math skills is proof of that. So, <laughs> but this is what Huxley seems to be doing in Chapter 2 with his uh, infant nurseries, uh, Neopavlo- Neopavlovian uh, conditioning rooms. We literally watch while a group of babies are conditioned with sirens and alarm bells and electric shocks. And what they are literally doing is conditioning them to hate books and flowers, all very Pavlovian. Right. So, you know, maybe they overestimated the power, but they weren't wrong about us being suggestible. And, you know, they call this moral education, this idea of manipulating the, the power of suggestion, the repetition of mantras many times and they do it while you're asleep uh but anyway it's through repetition that we get 
our beliefs. The idea is, and I don't think they were wrong about this. You could tell me if I'm wrong, but that if you hear something repeated over and over and over again, especially if it's suggested during these periods of weakness, it becomes part of your morality to the point that you don't question it anymore. And that's how you could possibly program an entire world to be happy. According to the director of the hatchery, to at last the child's mind is these suggestions and the sum of the suggestions is the child's mind and not the child's mind only, the adult's mind too, all his life long. The mind that judges and desires and decides are made up of suggestions. But all of these suggestions are our suggestions, suggestions from the state. Yeah, and this, of course, is how a few world controllers accomplish community identity and stability uh, which are the core values of the brave new world. And everyone is literally identical, not necessarily on the outside, although the lower castes are, but on the inside, everyone thinks exactly the same and no one thinks things they were uh, they were not told to think. But how do you do this um, well in this world? I mean, unlike 1984, where you have a police force watching you all the time, every means of control uh, is a perversion of something people really want. Uh First off, get rid of history and reading of ideas or even feelings. These things are hard and can be unpleasant. They can also provoke disagreement. Get rid of them. Henry Ford famously said, history is bunk. (laughs) Huxley takes him up on his offer. Uh, This world is genetically modified to have no pain, no deformity, no personal discrimination, except that which is controlled and conditioned by the state. Children are conditioned to not care about death by being given, you know, chocolate cream to eat while watching dying people being (laughs) ushered into oblivion on Soma and then cremated. You know, of course, at first glance, you might say, but what about love, friendship, that sort of thing? But Huxley's answer is you could be conditioned, you know, to not care about that. In fact... That's the source of your unhappiness if you think about it a lot of the time. What if you could have the sensations of happiness chemically produced without the drama of relationships? Wouldn't that be better? And so he sets up his first argument. Interesting that uh, he undervalued drama in relationships <laughs> is what some people thrive on. You know, and this book isn't just about that. I really think his discussion about drugs and the role of human sexuality, extremely, I think they're extremely interesting apart from their connection to the psychological conditioning. Oh, I absolutely agree. Uh, and the politics is super interesting, too. Uh, I want to say, if you're reading this book along with us, uh, with minors, don't get worried. There's no pornography or anything like that in the book. It was written in the 30s. But there will be some innuendo, nothing explicit, so you can breathe easy or, you know, disappointed, depending on what you were hoping well, to get. <laughs> it's not a Harlequin romance. I think oh, agree no, not at all. Uh, Well, and next episode, we will meet these characters as lifeless as they are. We'll watch their behaviors in discreet ways. And of course, uh, we will discuss other parts of Huxley's warnings about a brave new world. As always, uh, thanks for being with us today. Please follow us on your podcast app. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Most importantly, if you enjoy our work, please share it. Text an episode to a friend. Push out the link on your social media. Connect with us personally. When you share, we grow. Peace out.